Welcome to this interview with Stephen Goff, who is with Columbia University Medical School and has a, uh, a story to tell, a little bit of a story about XMRV and its first revelation here and, uh, and how that might or might probably not be too meaningful. But give us the, uh, the uptake on that. Sure. Well, a few years ago, uh, this virus was identified uh, just from its sequences in prostate cancers in uh, a small number of patients. And uh, the sequence of this new virus, uh, really the first new one in quite a while in humans, was exciting because it was so similar to a very large, uh, well-studied class of viruses called the xenotropic uh, mouse leukemia viruses. That's the XM mm -hmm. <laughs> the name. And um, those viruses in mice uh, have the potential to cause a variety of diseases. They cause leukemias, neurological uh, symptoms. And so the fact that this virus was found uh, you know, raised a lot of flags that this was something we needed to worry about. And uh, so people have been very actively in the last few years uh, screening uh, patients with prostate cancer. Um, people are finding it in small numbers. Um, we know very little about its mode of transmission. Uh, we don't have any reason yet to be excited about any uh, pathology. Um, but it's certainly something we want to pay attention to and make sure that we're not missing anything. And so we live as, as humans with a lot of viruses that are non-pathogenic or non-detrimental to the body. Right. So, but, um, so what would your next steps be? How do, what do you, do you follow this uh, just carefully? Let's kind of like be yeah. watchful. And yeah, I think people want to know a bunch of simple things. Um, be, it would be great to know the, the origin if it was a mouse or mm -hmm. some uh, mm -hmm. similar species. Uh, and these viruses are so similar that it's hard to believe it, it didn't at some point come from mice. Mm -hmm. We'd like to know how often it's, it's uh, made the jump from mice to humans. Is it happening all the time? Mm -hmm. uh, or it, was it a very rare event that is now spreading in humans? Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to know more about the possible modes of transmission, if it even happens, between humans. Mm -hmm. um, when we'd love to know the tissues in which it replicates, and we know a little about that now because we've studied the virus and culture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just a matter of, I think, fact gathering, and uh, the most maybe important thing is really the prevalence of the virus in the human population, mm -hmm. which we don't know. So the, the title of your presentation was Mouse to Man, and that, is that, that's considered a zoonotic uh, transmission, is that correct? Yeah, yeah that yeah, would be. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, where, where are you? Um, are there any other colleagues working on this, or is there is there some sense of urgency, or is this like is it just casually looking at it? Well, no. I, I mean, I think uh, the NCI, for example, uh, is is pretty uh, serious about it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to miss anything, mm -hmm. and they want to play a role in identifying uh, the properties of this virus and mm -hmm. its its mm -hmm. uh, potential risks. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty serious about it. You know, the the range of uh, anxiety. Uh, you know, is from very, very mild to, you know, the worst scenarios would be, gosh, do we need to worry about it getting into the blood bank? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do we need to be concerned uh, if it's really causing significant subset of prostate cancer? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the latest is the potential link reported this last year of uh, uh, association with chronic fatigue syndrome, mm -hmm. which would be you know, very exciting because that's a disease that's struggled to find a, a, a viral cause. Mm -hmm. and so that might be the cause. Huh? Could be. So, Could so be. how old do you think this virus is? I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it was in mice, you s suspect. Yeah. So it would be maybe in language there for years and years and years, much yes. the way maybe HIV did. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, the assumption is that this entered the mouse germ line, yeah, many, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, exists in mice generally as a benign uh, mm -hmm. a uh, provirus in the in the genome of those mice. It was really discovered uh, in a kind of funny way because mice that we work with don't uh, have the appropriate receptor for this virus, so they aren't actually uh, capable of sustaining an infection. Uh, so the only source of the virus is this integrated copy that's been in the mouse genome for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And the way it was discovered is that when people in the 70s started passing human cell lines through mice, Human cells have the receptor, most mammals do, and when the human cells were uh, passed through mice and then recovered out of the mice, they almost invariably acquired this virus. The mice had low levels 
they passed it to the human cells. The human cells were very mm -hmm. able to be infected. Mm -hmm. And so when people studied the human cells after they'd been through a mouse, lo and behold, they had this very interesting virus, mm -hmm. um, which people assumed was a human virus in the, in the early days, but were misled. It was a mouse virus. Uh, and people have studied at a low level basically since the 70s, um, not worrying very much about it at the time. Mm -hmm. But now having seen a very close relative uh, in uh, you know, a, a, a subset of humans, um, it certainly uh, made people want to pay attention. What, what is the normal, what is your field of work? What, what do you normally do day to day? I mean, uh, we are interested in all aspects of how these viruses, the mouse viruses and HIV, replicate, uh, in, in our case, almost always in culture. The big emphasis of the lab is identifying cellular proteins that the virus either uses or uh, needs to have for replication, mm -hmm. and there's quite a few of those. Um, and also cellular genes that are working to try to restrict the virus. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're using a lot of tools available to us today uh, to look in cells and culture for those kinds of genes. Mm -hmm. And I, they're, they're important because I, I think each of those, in principle, is a site of, of intervention. Mm -hmm. um, if one could interrupt uh, a necessary interaction of the viral uh, uh, protein with a cell, you'd in principle stop it, and we know cases where that's true. Mm -hmm. And if we knew more about the restriction systems that are not, not always working as well as we'd like, um, and we could make them better, I think that would be equally important. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been very helpful, I think, in making sure that we uh, just touch on this, yeah. because it's been explored here at the Croix. And so when people, we, and we talked about not being alarmist, because this is yes. not the way you go about things. You try to follow them very carefully, like you say. NCI, maybe the CDC, they all take a look at this and keep a watchful eye. Indeed. And I'm sure you will. All right, thank you very okay, much, Dr. Goff.